My guest on Abjure Interviews is a filmmaker, researcher and cryptid investigator who has written and directed the films we are going to chat about tonight. He's a good friend and I'm proud to be working with him on our upcoming film about the strange encounters on and around Winterhill. Please welcome Chris Turner. I got into this initially just probably more like most people just by purely by chance just had a friend that was into the strange stuff he was into weird media a bit darker than this genre that we're in now obviously I delve into crypto cryptids uh, ufology paranormal now which is it's like phenomenology it's being called now these days isn't it uh, it's all the phenomena LinkedIn one because we're so coming to the, the sort of realisation that all this stuff's connected one way or another. But I got into it purely just from a, a mate who was into David Icke of all people. And uh, event, we, we were chatting one day and we got into the idea, came up about making a film. And before we knew it, we'd bought a camera and we were in the Isle of Wight meeting David Icke and it was a, that was an experience. Because David, did, you know, you hear all the things about David Icke and all these stories, and none of it's true. David is just a really down-to-earth bloke. Uh, at that time, he was with oh, his second wife, and she was great. Uh, really friendly, accommodating, couldn't do enough for you. Doesn't charge you any money, doesn't want any money. Uh, and, you know, we were there for hours on end, and I think in the end, he made us tea. <laughs> And that was just the first time we'd met him. Obviously, since then, I've, I've gone back two or three times to, to interview David. But primarily, that was about... We met David, who made a film about the, the agenda that's got unfolding at the minute. I won't go into detail because of your channel. But all that dark stuff, really, is where I started. So I started really deep, a bit deep in the hole, if you know what I mean. Uh, but the, the further you go down that rabbit hole, I quickly realised that it does start to affect your mood and it starts to affect your interests and it starts not necessarily to have negative effects. It's just sometimes it can get overwhelming because when you get into that agenda and you realise who, who these people are or who these entities are, even with the stuff that we're talking about, it's quite dark and it's an element, we can talk about this later, but it's an element of ufology or phenomenology now that a lot of the gatekeepers within ufology don't want to talk about. They don't want to talk about the negative ETs or the negative entities, what I'm going to call them ETs, because I don't really believe that the majority of these beings are extraterrestrial. That's just some... They're all from space, Star Trek, blah, 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 various civilizations. Well... The evidence to me doesn't suggest that. It suggests that there are some, but it, there's another side to the coin, as you all know. So, yeah, that's really out where it started for me. And slowly, as I said earlier, you, you can get very quickly from dark, ritualistic, satanic, magic subjects within, you know, within elements of secret societies, for example. You can quickly get to... Uh, the alien agenda or the ET agenda, demonology, and then from there you can easily get to any of these subjects, cryptids being another one of these things because cryptids aren't just a big hairy friendly Bigfoot that wants to swap mm. buttons with you. you know, <laughs> when you hear the accounts, you sometimes you know, on occasion you're dealing with something very sinister uh, that fits various descriptions. 
Uh, some of those descriptions don't appear to be something living in the wilds in somewhere like Canada, for example, where it's pretty viable and I believe it is possible for a flesh and blood, you know, hominid to be existing out there and to have always existed out there, for, certainly since uh, civilization began, if you want to. If I want to go back, I don't know. But yeah, that's that's where it really started me. So yeah, I think Lloyd Pye is a fascinating guy. He, he's one of the guys that I, I was looking into when I first got into the cryptid stuff. Lloyd Pye stuff was is that that I think it's quite an infamous lecture that he did. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Know a lot about Lucy and talking about uh, the origin of, of the Big Four Sasquatch. And, uh, the skeletons and the lack of fossils and all that stuff is just fascinating and he was the guy that then just like Pi just opened the door to, to this he's sort of like he's one of those guys that really smart figured it out he figured it out and he's one of a bunch of guys Valet's another one all those guys involved in the Stargate projects there's so many of these guys now playing this they're not gatekeeping purposely they're, they're gatekeeping because they probably haven't got much choice and they would rather be part of this disclosure of not ET, it's disclosure about whatever is going on. Because I don't think that they're going to just disclose ET. That's not ET. They're going to disclose one, they're going to disclose whatever they want us to think it is. But when you watch the hearings that just happened just recently, I know a lot of ufologists and some of them were very well-known ones. And I'm even I'm surprised at some of the well-known names that are buying into this. And I'm not going to hold it against them. And, and I don't think they're wholly buying into it. I think they're well-known. There's something going on on the side. I just think that they're trying to... A lot of them have been in the game 30 years, 40 years. And now they're finally, after all this year, is researching and pushing for some form of disclosure. We should be happy that the that the finally, you know, the the witnesses and people that have been a part of abductions or whatever else, or even cover ups. Well, when you were saying earlier on uh, about this dark side, when you start looking at this dark side, and then you start looking at this disclosure, which the sort of throwing in our face. Personally, <clears throat> I think differently, which. If I talk about it on my channel, I'd, I'd get struck off straight away. Yeah, we can't talk about the real agenda because no. one, we won't have time. No, <laughs> because this is a long time, this yeah. is multifaceted, and there's a reason that the, there are guys out there that lecture for ten hours non-stop because they, even then they can't even scratch the surface. But in regards to to this recent disclosure it's can you just i just want people to think about it which they probably already are because the guys people our community is pretty smart they're pretty switched on real to this now to this game that we're playing it is a game imagine some of those dominoes falling over you know for example you cannot name names of highly important influential politicians or people in power you cannot name a name and say that individual was part of a cover up. What was he covering up? Well, he was covering up the fact that we captured the craft. Okay. What does the craft do? Well, it's anti gravity. Okay. What does that mean? Well, it means that we've developed these craft of our own. It now means that we don't need fossil fuels. Imagine that domino going over. Yeah. That's just one domino. We don't need fossil fuels. There's no need for poverty. There's no need for hunger. There's there's no need for poverty at all anywhere in the world. And that domino cannot go over. It cannot, and it will not. And that's what I'm trying to... When I, when I just when we converse just loosely about this with friends and people that come into work or just people in general on Facebook, people are aware of this. They know this. Because the other dominoes that follow that are, well, who are these people? Well, how does it work? How does the magic work? What does that do? How do they summon them? Imagine how many dominoes there are, and it only takes one to fall, the wrong domino to fall over, and they will never let that happen. Grush, whoever this guy is. I don't buy it, sorry. I don't buy it for a second. I do not buy it for a second. 
I think he's just playing his part and he may have good intentions and he may well know that his part in this is a 20-year plan to really open the doors up to what's really going on if they ever do that, which I very much doubt because this goes this this goes down deep, dark holes that nobody wants to go down. Uh, and people that really know the subject know this. Uh, but I can totally understand why they only want to talk about the fringe stuff and why it's exciting for politicians and people that, I mean, you listen to some of those politicians, they have no idea what's going on, do they? They are green as grass. And when you're dealing with it, you know, you're dealing with, it's like dealing with a bunch of kids, really. They have no idea about the subject. How easy are they going to be to fool? You know, it's just... It's just not going to happen. They're only going to disclose what they want to disclose and we'll be happy with it because we've no choice. Uh, and I haven't really spoken to any people that are experienced about this. I, I would, I'd love to know what they think about this because that ain't, you know, they might possibly disclose that, there's, that these ETs or whatever they're going to describe them as have conducted abductions but they're certainly not going to mention the detail <laughs> they're not going to go into the detail about this it's just not going to happen it might disclose a little bit of information about a very well known case Colares might be a case that could come up, the Brazil case in Colares where the UFOs were shooting laser beams at the, at the residents of that island in Brazil and the, the authorities came in, the military came in trying to solve it and they were attacked I think that was disclosed in 2020. Uh, but there's so many of these cases that you could talk about. And there's always another element to that. Another, you know, just by chance, Die Out Love came up. I was on my YouTube channel the other day and I was really skimming through videos. And that's another one you can get into. The real story behind Die Out Love, which is not what they're saying it is. And it goes into areas that we can't talk about. Most of this stuff goes into areas so we can't talk about. It does, yeah. Uh, you know, I've said it before, you go back 10 years on YouTube, it's fascinating. You could talk about any of this stuff. There's fascinating information out there and people spilling the guts about all this stuff. But it's just not going to happen. I mean, there are a lot of other platforms now which I'm going to try and get into myself and start putting my own content to it because eventually I don't believe the channel that we're on now will be much use for anything other than uh, disclosing what they you know the same old story the same old stuff I mean because how long is it going to be before this disclosure thing gets into cryptids is it going to get into cryptids will it ever get into cryptids will it get into hauntology as it's now called poltergeist are they going to talk about that nah I doubt it I don't, no I, I, don't, I don't know I don't know where it's going to go to but you know, you could always bring the subject up of uh, Project uh, Bluebeam. Is well, it heading that way? I, I sometimes wonder whether, you know, Bill Cooper talked about that, I think, a long time ago before he was gone out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was one of many. Phil Schneider was another one that I think hinted at that. So many of people that hinted at that, and uh, you don't really hear from those people anymore. They're either ousted out of the UFO community. And they're talking a long time ago now. It's been common knowledge, hasn't it, for the last yeah, 10 it. years that this is what they're going to do. And just because it's it's out there doesn't mean that they won't do it. It just might be done in the way a little bit more advanced than we think. If, if nothing, this this the people behind this or the, the, the intelligence, shall we say, behind this agenda is incredibly intelligent because I, my belief is that we're dealing with some form on one hand of AI. And we only have to look at our AI. Imagine Google's AI, the super sensitive yeah. AI now. Incredible. On a very basic level, just as an individual, they know everything about you and me now. They know everything about us. They're most likely recording your conversations. I'm not saying it's conspiratorial, but they pretty much are. Only bots, and a lot of it's done for marketing purposes, but I'm not talking about people like me. I'm talking about people who they're interested in. Yeah. You know, imagine what they really know about members of parliament, for example, or serious politicians or people working in 
secret projects. There won't be a thing they don't know about these people. And that's how, that's just our AI. Imagine if you're a super advanced, uh, I'll say a race, if you're a super advanced race and that you, you develop this AI. Maybe you are AI. You can get into John Lash's work, yeah. the Archons and all the rest of it. You can, how deep do you want to go? How long have we got? Uh, but yeah, just the, the basic example is even now simple programs like ChatGPT, for example, are incredibly intuitive. They can do incredible things and do things that would take us hours and end, weeks on end, for that matter. So if you as an intelligence that were just using AI as a tool to create and let's say you wanted to see how a certain agenda played out, well, that's all been done. You know, in the early days, it was done with think tanks working out, you know, statistics and old school statistics. And where do you think this is going to play out? Where the vote's going to go? That's not done anymore. AI is completely scanning internet, it's scanning every database it's got hold of, and it's running out various scenarios, and it knows the outcome before it happens, which is what's happening now. They know the out- what the outcome of what they're going to do. They already know what the outcome is. And that, that's not me get being, like, you know, getting too far down the, the rabbit hole. That's me just being... It's a simple logic. If you've got advanced AI, which is used in the elections, for example, even just, just by analysts looking at wh- where the vote's going to go, then they already know what the outcome of, of this disclosure of movement is going to be. They know when they play this piece, we're going to play that piece. It's, this is a game of chess, but it's like a four-dimensional game of chess. It's... <coughs> I, I always look at it as a... A theatre. Yeah, you know, it's exactly like, what it is, or, yeah. or watching a film, you know, it, it's we're we're all in that film in that theatre together. The the directors and producers all know how it's going to end up in. The, you yeah, know, yeah, it's a bit like the Truman Show, though. Yeah, a yeah, bit. Exactly. And it sometimes feels like that. Maybe it is that. I mean, you, when you've got a, you know very well known physicists talking about this, that you know it's a simulation and all the rest of it, it probably is. And there's yeah. more talking about it now, isn't there? Yeah, so, but is that just the latest trend? Who knows? But see, yeah. that's sometimes I think that I think you know, like, are we being given this as part of the next step of the agenda? So we all think a certain way. This is it. it, it that's you you're know, dealing. Like, I've said it before. Yeah, you're dealing with a, a You're dealing with. An intelligence that can outthink you, it can outsmart you. It's way, way, way ahead of you. It's, a, it's potentially dozens and dozens of steps ahead. And sometimes it feels you feel a little bit powerless when you think when I think about that. That's why I stepped away from all that darker stuff because it does at times you, you feel absolutely powerless. Now I should probably say at this point that. I do understand how consciousness works and I understand how manifestation works and it's very real. And actually, people like Jacques Vallée and Ben Rich and other people that spoke about just in ufology and how this phenomena works, it's, it's connected to consciousness and manifestation. You know, when you conjure a UFO, what are you doing? Are you manifesting that? Now, it's the word manifest. What does it actually mean? What does conjure actually mean? And it's all definitions and perspective isn't it it's uh so as as dark as it seems sometimes on, on occasion you know we're not entirely powerless uh, certainly not in your own circle you're not powerless you can you can shift your reality at any time uh it's just you know a lot of this a lot of guys have talked about this years and years ago uh terence mckenna and ike and other people before them once you understand, like you said, that it's a game, once you understand that it's a game and it's being played on multiple levels, all right, they might have written the rules, but there are some rules they didn't write. Some rules are fundamental, and I feel some rules are fundamental in this, whatever's going on. Um, we all have our own power in our own way. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it sometimes, uh, especially when you've got to, you've got to function in this reality. And at times... The rules of the game make it very difficult, don't they? You know, we're all under a lot of stress. But everybody's under stress. You know, financial stress, work stress. Uh, the kids are under stress. Enormous stress. The kids are under enormous stress. Mm. It's, it's horrible. 
actually. Uh, and, you know, you would imagine that this modern technology should be taking the stress off of us, but it just seems to be increasing it. But everybody in this subject is pretty much aware of that. And it's another thing, you know, there are people that talk about this but for a living and it's not, again, it's not a really pleasant thing to be talking about. At least I got into this, especially the cryptid stuff, because it's a little bit of escapism. It's the one, you know, ufology a little bit too, but cryptozoology and the interest in cryptids is the one, uh, the one byproduct of it is, is that you've got to go out and investigate it. And when you do, you you're happen to be out in nature, which is fantastic. Yeah. And it <clears throat> relieves the stress. And it's, I think it's why I became so interested in it, because a lot of the other researchers, like, like I said earlier, is sitting and reading. And as great as that is, and you're acquiring knowledge, it's difficult to retain that when you're trying to take so much on, and it can get overwhelming. Whereas when you're out and about in nature, you know, even if you don't see a cryptid, you're still out there having a good time. And you're actually de-stressing without even realising it. So that's why that's why I think a lot of people love this. Yeah, we're never going to probably photograph a cryptid. We're never going to see one. But there are great parts of being out with your mates and in a lot of good people in this community. And that's part of the appeal, I think, is that a lot of people, especially after the last few years, anyone needs an opportunity to get out there. Just get an interest in this. And even if you don't believe which I believe is probably the wrong word, even if you don't have any evidence of it. It's certainly there's still stuff to look at with the big cats, and that's the one thing we do have evidence of. So if you're into the big cats and you want to get out there and hunt them with a, you know, looking for prints or, you know, photographs or whatever, you don't need much of an excuse to get out and enjoy the countryside because the one thing Britain hasn't got is a lack of that. You know, we might be small in comparison to some of these other countries, but we've got some beautiful countryside, and it's, you know, getting to the film elusive and I'm, I'm making the sequel now that's why i wanted that was one of the film part of the part of the film was i wanted to show that i wanted to show that countries that a lot of countries think that we're a little bit of a concrete jungle i think you know they see london and they see manchester and birmingham and think well where are these cryptids going high where are these cats going to go but you know i think getting onto some of the research that andy mcgrath did i think what is it 10 percent of england is urban sprawl, so that means 90% of it is, is not, and is it 7% of Wales, and Scotland's even less, I think. Yeah. Is it 4% of Scotland? Uh, is uh, rural, so uh, it's urban, sorry, and so you've got all that rural space, yeah, a lot of it's farmland and open space, but, you know, there's no humans there, there's no one frequenting those places, which is why big cats and whatever else may be out there, uh, that's why it's so fascinating to get out there because there's every chance, particularly at the moment, these cats are being seen more and more this time of year as well. Uh, it's a regret time to get out and investigate the big cats, I think. Uh, there's a group of guys going out there, Andy McGrath, one of the guys that's, that's doing some research into that now. Uh, so, yeah, there's every chance that you could come across one of them. I know you spoke to people that have seen them. Yeah. I spoke yeah. to people that have seen them. So they definitely exist. You know, the, the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's terrible, sorry. Uh, but yeah, it's out. It's the cat's out of the bag. It's, uh, and I think that's just a matter of time before the authorities admit that. Uh, and they probably should be protected, I think. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there's never been any attacks. I don't think there ever will be any attacks. The one thing Britain, again, it's got a great, great deal of countryside and a great deal of sheep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the farmers might not be that chuffed about that. But... Uh, there's a lot of sheep, a lot too many deer, for example. There's way too many deer, so there's no shortage of food for these for these big well, cats. Well, there's not. When you think about it, I mean, yeah, the sheep, it's easy for them to catch. Yeah. But there's the deer as well. The the deer population is is very high, yeah. and we don't see them as well. You know, well, I, I know me going out to, uh, up around Winterhill and looking around there, I see a lot of deer. But anyone from the town here, like in Bolton near to there, when they're walking around outskirts, they don't see a deer. They don't even think that there's deer no. up there. No, you see one on occasion, and particularly in the early mornings, and now and then you'll get the sense, won't you? When you're out and about, you'll just get a sense. You'll feel, you'll sense yeah. the deer, and it'll be there. It'll just be less. It's still just looking at you. Yeah. And the magic, those, those moments, it's just a deer, but it's still 
you know, yeah. on occasion you'll see a hair as well, which I don't see. I, I've, I've seen a huge thing. It was frightened the life out of me, actually. I stumbled upon it and it, it bugged the size of it, I think. But it's all out there. It's all out there. And uh, that's the fascinating side. And I think it's why the cryptid research is one of the areas people find it really easy to get into and find it really enjoy. They enjoy it a lot because there's a lot of groups now that people can join. And it's part rambling, part waffling. Uh, that's what and, we do. And you camping know. as well. And camping, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, the camping side of it's a bit tricky, isn't it? Because they're trying to put a stop to that. Yeah, uh, unfortunately. There's a lot of these uh, areas now that are being used for study areas that are closed off to the public, which is a bit... Hmm. Let's talk about the British Bigfoot and your film Elusive. Yeah, the British Bigfoot was not a subject I ever saw myself getting into. And if I'm honest, I don't actually know how it really happened. I can't remember how, but my filmmaking and my journey in this genre has always been a bit like that. There are no coincidences, I don't think. Things have always fell in my lap, and since the making of the first film I did, which was 1984, I did a film called 1984 Revolution, and then I did a film called 2012, about 2012, and then I did a film, the uh, Don't Mention the Reptilians film that we'll talk about later. And all this this sequence of events has just been coincidence after coincidence, and it's I feel that it's been that this is on purpose. Now, whether our lives are pre-planned, I don't know, but we cer- there's certainly free will, and we've certainly got, in my opinion, I think we've got to say where we end up. But I do believe that there are influences, and this might be people influencing. You know, I'm running my life, and you're running your life now. We knew each other through my wife. We didn't know that at the time. Our mutual connection was my wife. Yeah. We, you know, who'd have thought that all them years ago you were uh, attending classes with Lorraine, and now you and I are making a film together, it's, and we're, we're investigating the same subjects and things like that. Small little coincidences like that has, has happened to me all the time, and it might be. A book you find in a library, or you might buy at a boot sale, or it might be a random email from a stranger that connects you with another researcher, and all of a sudden you'll find you've got this connection with that researcher, and they've been looking at you, and you've been looking at them, and right, really strange things that appear random but are not random at all, and that's, I think that's how I ended up in this in this cryptid scene, because. It is connected this, to this phenomena, certainly in this country, and that's the conclusion that I've now come to, that this is not, in my opinion, I'm pretty certain, I'm not going to say 100% because I'm not 100%, I'm pretty certain that this is not a flesh and blood creature most of the time. There could be some sort of relic, I wanted that somehow has avoided contact, somehow, uh, certainly in Scotland, I think that would probably be one of the only places that that could happen in remote areas in Scotland. Uh, but for the most part, the cases that I've come across, more more often now there is a strange, we'll call it paranormal element to that. Equally, in the early days, in the first, in 2016, 2017, when I started looking into this, they appeared to all be physical. You know, one big foot is poking a stick in the ground, or, you know, someone just stumbled upon one and it was walking across the river, or just going about its day. Nothing paranormal about the encounter at all. But of late, if you, it seems to me that you, if you shift away from what we would call the British Bigfoot or the, the, the Green Man, the Wild Man of Britain, that traditional hairy hominid that we see sometimes on the medieval uh, artwork and on churches and cathedrals. Or, uh, when you start getting into these werewolf-type accounts, which I came across with a, a friend of mine, Paul Sinclair, you know Paul very well, that was really the first time I thought, hmm, this is weird. Now, 
since the making of Elusive, I didn't really delve too deep into the werewolf phenomena because six years ago it was relatively not 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 new but wow how things have changed in six years uh it's hugely popular the dog man werewolf phenomenon now is everywhere there are groups everywhere investigating it there are films on it in all of america and canada and, and guys out there it's like people like small town monsters uh seth breed love to investigate this stuff and makes documentaries about it and it's great that he does that but it's become the dogman has become such a popular cryptid if you like if there's a in the popularity stakes it used to be mothman but now all of a sudden uh it's the werewolf on that note um you seem to the cycle of how it seems to go from one thing to another and certainly ends up a, yeah. going back to it. There's certainly a pop culture cycle. There is with everything, isn't there? Every, anything in fashion. And it's, you know, you know, we're not. <laughs> you can't exclude this genre from from fashion, the fashion of the day or the pop culture. You can't. It's just a trend. It's like there's 50 saucers. You know, that was the trend back in the 50s. It was a flying saucer. Now it's it's, it's changed a little bit. The phenomenon is the phenomenon has changed how it appears, if you like. Uh, again, we can, there's something else we can talk about later on. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It's all all cycles. Uh, but these were these werewolf accounts certainly there's a certainly a, a paranormal nature to them for a number of reasons. One, obviously, they can't they can't be a breeding population of these things. They just wouldn't go on scene. Uh, and although you can argue about Bigfoot in the fossil record, you can argue about that with the, the DNA that's been captured, the, the human element of that DNA. The canine thing is a little bit weird. It's a bit different. What you can talk about, and the more I talk about it with Paul Sinclair, the more I think there's another element to this which could be magical. There could be a ritualistic magic side to, to this phenomena. Akin to the skinwalker, you know, the skinwalker element is very different. There are certain things, very, very dark magic. You've got, again, we can't talk about it now, but there are certain things to acquire that status that you have to do. Very, very dark things. Yeah. Now, whether that applies here to the phenomena and we're, not, we're just not aware of it, it's highly likely that it does. But it seems to me there is, as strange as it sounds, whether this is a projection of an image whether this is something that people, when we see these things, whether this is a projected image through magic and they're doing something to, you know, whether they believe it, this whatever magical ritual or spell that they're casting, whatever people are seeing, that is appears at the time to be real. Like forming a tulpa. A forming a tulpa. Uh, are they forming a tulpa around themselves? Are they... I said, a little bit like transfiguration, that you could say. Yeah. Is it a form of transfiguration, this? I don't know. Look, there's a number of options out there, and no one knows. We don't know. We don't know, but it's fascinating to talk about. And it's one element of this. Now, there could well be, if we're going to, if we're going to talk about the extraterrestrial element of this, Ben Wall gets a guy that looks in, he's very heavy into the uh, extraterrestrial hypothesis in regards to Bigfoot. Sasquatch, and you could apply it to werewolves. There are account, there are accounts in America. Jody Cooks in, in, investigated a couple of these with an extra ter, extraterrestrial UFO connection, you know. And a lot of this phenomena phenomena is linked. But what is a UFO? What mm. type of UFO are we dealing with? Is it a UFO? Is it an orb? Is it a is it a plasma being? Is it what is it? Again, this is why it's really important for people taking these accounts out there to get the fine detail because these are the I think the devil is in the detail, and sometimes, if not all the time, a lot of the fine detail is lost just by having an encounter because it's so overwhelming. And I've had even when I saw the lights up at Benson, you know, it's, there's something happens, doesn't it, to the brain? Something happens when you witness this phenomena that, that just switches off part of our brain uh, and incidentally I talked about that today with Steve Mayer it's something he's looking into and there's a guy called Carl the Crusher on YouTube that's looking at events at the Wilson Ranch which is yeah. a precursor to Skinwalker Ranch where that phenomenon is and there's a connection with 
brain waves and theta brain pattern, theta brain waves, and what the phenomena appears to be doing to an individual when it witnesses, you know. So if an individual goes out investigating Dogman, they'll see Dogman. Potentially, you could argue that. Yeah, you could, you could certainly argue that. Uh, that is something... I mean, it's interesting, like you mentioned, historic trends in the past, yeah. you know, the fairy folk. No, it's not the fairy folk. Apparently, the fairy folk are not very common these days. Why is that? It's just a description of narrative, isn't it? It's just, it's just a language yeah. barrier. It's just a change in modern language, I, I feel. Uh because the mechanisms and the descriptions and the, the actions of these beings or entities or this intelligence is exactly the same. There is no difference. Uh, I think Pierre Sabak's writing a book on folklore right now, the Fae and, and folklore, and so I'll be probably the first to buy that because Pierre Sabak's work is fascinating. Yeah, it is. Uh, so Interesting read. Yeah, and very recently I got into Jo Hickey Hall stuff. She's great. She's really good. Do you know, I, I, again, it's one of those areas, Chris, you're going to, you know, soon be getting into researching the fair and fairies, and it's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> but it is all connected, and there is, fair and the fairies are the, are the ETs and the demons, you know, it's the same, mm. essentially we're dealing with the same thing. And again, the out there, or the, you know, the get out of jail free card there is that we've always not I don't think you can commit to it how can anyone commit to any opinion when you don't know we don't know so again I've said it before I'll, I'll, I'll happily change my mind next week if I read a piece of literature or I speak to a witness that's got something really interesting to say that I haven't heard before then it goes in the log it goes in the book and we look at it again it's sad what you are saying earlier on though isn't it? you know like how, how certain things come to you and it changes your mind as, as you go along. Of course, as you were, we're all adapting. That's, I mean, again, it's an old age old quote, but we're, science is the same. You know, I'm not a big, huge fan of certainly modern science, not at all. Uh, uh, science is a religion, isn't it? But uh, the scientific method, shall I say, mm. that is the scientific method. It doesn't appear to be a knife for some reason, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the scientific method is what we're all doing. We're just, you know, you don't have to be a scientist to use those principles. And that is take information, form an opinion, test your hypothesis, or form, an, form a hypothesis and, and move it and change it and advance it. Uh, and sometimes that means taking backward steps, a lot of backward steps. I mean, if you look at ufology now, or uh, phenomenology as we'll call it, we're constantly taking steps back now because we're going back, looking at what researchers like Bill Cooper and Jacques Vallée and all those guys that were up at the Wilson Ranch and other guys in, in the Stargate project and projects beyond that, Project Saucer, the Skull Experiment, we're constantly going back because we're now re-evaluating what these guys were writing about. The Collins Elite is another one. For anyone not familiar with the Collins Elite, they were looking at the religious demonic aspect of this phenomena. I'll tell you what, you look at that now. It's more relevant than it's ever been. And it ties in, there's people like Nathaniel Gillis looking at this, Steve Mera, Barry Fitzgerald, other researchers, all those guys, Valet and all, all those guys, uh, some of the guys involved with Christopher Mellon at the moment that are still active. Hal Puthoff is another one of those guys. They're all aware of this stuff. They're all aware of the connection between this intelligence, whatever it is. Is it AI? Well, partly AI, I think. But yeah, all these subjects, the British Bigfoot and all, that's how, that's how, how see, how, I know I waffle a lot, but how quickly did I get from Bigfoot to UFOs real quick? Because yeah, I see that connection. Yeah. I think we all come to a conclusion where we, where we get to that, where we, we think everything is connected. Well, you know, earlier I was talking about, I, I, I like a lot of the, you know, the mentors of mine. One of my mentors is, is James Bartley. He yeah. Got me. He looked at the reptilian stuff. One of his mentors was Barbara Bartholik, Carl Turner. Uh, you, you talk about Alex Collier, the old old school like ufologists, or we'll call them old school, well, the 90s. It's not that that old, but you, do you know what I mean? It would be considered now like you know, for people that really know the subject. Those in, in, encounters that they're and the stuff Carla was writing about, particularly in James Bartley's research into the reptilian phenomena and the serpent phenomena, is 
it's very it's never been more relevant because again it's one of those dominoes this yeah. is a domino the ancient cultures it's a domino if it goes over it's not going to go over by the way but if it does mm. <laughs> there, there, there are consequences and I guarantee you that when they run the program to see how this turns out it doesn't feature any of those dominoes going over because it won't happen it can't happen so yeah the the elusive was a the witnesses in elusive were great really uh, which is why it spawned a sequel it just so happens that the sequel that I'm working on now one I do want to again detail how vast and beautiful Britain is it's part of the film and it's sort of like a journey film if you like without getting too deep but it's it's something that people talked about they want that as part of the you know it, the encounters are great I mean I love interviewing the witnesses and listening to the encounters but it's also sometimes good to pull away from that and in, and and let it be more of a film let it be more of a documentary we're not just documenting sightings we're documenting I'm kind of documenting what I'm doing if you like and where I'm going and what I'm seeing and why I think what I think that's that's the intention it's harder to do when you go down a paranormal road because Elusive 2 is really about the paranormal element of this. Uh, still very physical accounts in there that, can, that could potentially be uh, fully physical flesh and blood encounters, but mainly it's about where I just went then. It's about how quickly you can get from the flesh and blood or the corporeal to the supernatural paranormal real quick. And fans, people who are not fans of, of our genre, they all say that, well, you're playing, you get a jail card free, and the only reason you want to do play that supernatural card is because you know you'll never find them. And they would be partly right, but again, because of this recent development now, because they've now disclosed these that they have biologics, is how they termed it, not from Earth, well then, you know, if, if that's all they ever do, well, that door is wide open now. You no longer have to play that card because it's been acknowledged. So I don't know what the poo-pooers are going to make now of that statement. They'll probably say, well, David Grish is a liar, there's no proof, and he's just heard it third hand, which is kind of true. Uh, but I suspect that there will be declassifications of things that will, 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 will count as solid proof, which then lends into our argument that perhaps what people are seeing is part of this intelligence, whatever it may, it may be, and that people are not imagining this stuff. I never thought they were imagining it. I wouldn't be bloody sleeping in forests on my own <laughs> if I thought they were imagining it. I'd rather be at home. Uh, I'm sure you would, I know you've done it. Uh, the camping outside of it is not, it's supposed to be wonderful working up to nature. It's one thing being on in the Lake District on a mountain, waking up to the sun rising. It's another thing being in a deep, dark forest where when the sun comes out, it's still dark. Well, it definitely is. You know, and and you getting and there's ticks all over you, and then you got to go home and you got to get a tick removing thing and get them off, and then worry whether you've got Lyme disease or not. <laughs> that, that, that's one of the parts for anyone out there doing this, especially in Scotland. Uh, you know, one day I came back from Scotland and I think I had four or five ticks that I had to only lava. I was fortunate, I was lucky, to be honest. But it's one of the downsides that you a lot of people don't talk about it, you know, because you've got to you've got to get to those parts of Scotland and you've got to get eaten alive by the midge mm -hmm. in certain times of year. You've got to try and avoid the wetlands so you don't get eaten alive. So that you can actually go out there and research. Otherwise the parts times of the year you can't venture in Scotland. You will get eaten alive and you will be very ill. Just Wait, just wait for the right time to go and just do your researches. Paul and I were planning a trip to, to Ben McDewey, uh, but we'll be going with a guide. We'll yeah. be going with someone that knows the place because that's part of being into this subject. And it's very similar to any sort of form of research. If, if you can form an alliance or associates in, in an area that you, you're new in, sir, so, you're going to find that journey much easier. You know, I wish, you know, a lot of people helped me when I was getting into the, the cryptid stuff. A lot of people held my hand, you know. They weren't all British either. They were saying, you know, Chris, look at this, look at this. And 
it's part of getting into any any genre. And I think now, you see, that's even a lot of people just coming into the cryptid stuff. They've no interest in ufology. They've no interest in hauntology or, or, or phenomenology or any of the stuff that people wouldn't necessarily connect to it. But it will help, as you know, it will help your research. Even stuff that you look into, even the dowsing, for example, earth energies. Yeah. It's relevant. Absolutely it's relevant. More, more, more relevant than ever. I know we, we, we haven't talk, talked about it, but that just goes to show mm-hmm. it's yet another element that's, that people some, will, will probably miss. Yeah. Or could miss. Some of the things I have looked into, uh, I'm finding more and more that we've got power lines going through as well. And I was wondering whether the power the the power going through them lines were affecting the energies going through the land, especially near quarries. I think there are a number of the the, the obviously the electromagnetic spectrum and the field down to UV light and down to energies coming off granite, for example, and the way that affects the land and quarry and how that affects the land and all these things geology and you know we don't know anything about geology. We know the very, very basics of it, you know, but again, it's another field. It's a bit like the dendrology when I was looking at the Bigfoot stuff, the study of trees, why trees bend the way they do. We we had to look at, speak to a dendrologist, a tree specialist, who explained, well, the trees bent because it's diseased or the trees bent because of this. You know, and it's only by speaking to those people that you become wise to the fact that not everything is a Bigfoot bending. Don't get me started on... Don't get me started. No, I am going to do. I am going to do because uh, I was the same. I, I used to think, you know, I did. a bent tree. Oh, I did. that's Bigfoot, you know. And 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 I was talking to someone um, who works in forestry commission about how they put lean branches against trees for the insects to use yeah. over winter and uh, hibernate. Uh, more than ever now. More but than sometimes ever. Sometimes you say that to someone and it's no, no. I, 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 I think it's a simple mistake to make. It really is. I, you know, I made a, there's a whole. If people want to watch it, there's a whole video of about an hour long on when I went a trip that I took to Scotland with Andy McGrath, and we were looking at tree structures specifically. We went to investigate why is this not happening in dark forests in Scotland? Why is it not? And it isn't. You know, where there are no people, you do not find structures. Oh, I didn't anyway. And I'm not saying I've been all over Scotland, but I've been around it enough to suggest that it's people doing this and logic tells me that it's people doing this because whenever i frequent and spent years years frequenting these areas and you have yourself it's kids it's hikers it's it's travelers it's porches always next to the path always next to the path you go off the path the deep into the forest nothing happens mm. a tree might fall by accident the there are occasions when I thought this is odd you know there are occasions when I have thought that because again I'm not going to rule it out entirely because when you look at the the videos in Canada for example when a a whole tree is smashed into the ground upside down you know that's not that's not people doing that it's possible that that I believe is whatever these creatures are doing that yeah well I'm talking this country yeah I mean in, in this country uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't uh, yet. Uh, let's just say I've yet to see, I've yet to be convinced otherwise that this is nothing more than than just nature or people. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> we, we, we quickly got in and out of that subject because you know it's an interesting, it is an interesting area of research. It's just not for me. I've been, I, I looked at it long enough and wasted plenty of time looking at it, only to realise that. Yeah, it will get you out of the house, but that's all it'll do. Yeah. You know, it's not going to do anything. You know, there's never going to be any proof given by looking at a stick upside down or twisted in any direction. Not when 12 people walk past that spot every day. You know? True. And even when, even out there, you've probably done it yourself, even when you're sat on a lawn in the forest next to your tent and you're twiddling a branch, you realise before you even, you, oh, well, I've just tied this in the knot. Look at what I've just done. You know, it's that simple. Sometimes it's just that simple. People get fed up or people just do random things. You know, how often do you see a kid running down the street in his own zone with a stick, just in his own, completely yeah. in his own world? And that, when, when we were kids, that's exactly what we did in the woods. You just did stuff in the woods for no bloody reason. 
And that, a lot of the time, that's what we're looking at. Yeah, I remember as a kid getting sticks and using them as uh, walking aids. Yeah. You know, and then yeah. sticking them in ground off road. Oh, so far. Yeah. yeah, and then we... That's why we stripped them off the lead and we did yeah. that and we did it for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it's an interesting area of research in, in other countries, in, in places that are really very, very remote. You're only dealing with you're dealing with places that are so vastly different to, to this country. And, and I wouldn't imagine you get much argument from the Canadians and the Americans about this. They'll look at what we're photographing and go, guys, come on, this is, this is just stupid. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, you can't rule it out entirely. And if people want, look, I just do what I do. I don't tend not to bother what other people do. That's another thing you learn quickly in this oh, yeah, in I've, this genre. Just I've get on with what idea. you're doing. And uh, sometimes you people will ask you for your advice for what it's worth. Most of the time, I found you got to learn the hard way. You got to learn yourself. You got to experience yourself. Uh, but it's sometimes you're better for it by experiencing it yourself and it won't take too long before people will realise that well I guess in a sense you could qualify the reptilians as a cryptid because as you know there are parts of uh, uh, the south in America that are witnessing the the swamp alligator man they call him uh, or lizard man uh, in, in some county uh, in some uh, of the states they call him and I think Ben Walgate saw an upright bipedal lizard type being when you were a lad in, in in the forest yeah so i mean again when i made the film uh don't mention the reptilians that was off the back of david ike's research and uh james bartley's research uh i never really gave the cryptid element of that i thought i didn't think you know it was only later on at the first again the first port of call with the reptilian stuff off the back of David Ike's work was the sense that these are fourth dimensional entities that are, you know, much like the jinn, that they, they can perform numerous, meta, they have multiple metaphysical abilities, that they have the ability to deconstruct reality, so they have the ability to change form, change shape, control your thoughts, parallel, all those things uh, connected to uh, the UFO abduction, if you like. Uh, they, share, they, they share all those characteristics, uh, but they're also connected very much to the jinn. So now they're connected to cryptids. And then it's very easy to get to the jinn. Who, the jinn were meant to be a, a life form that existed on the planet before we arrived. The, the earth was meant to be theirs, and then they were banished to the fourth dimension, allegedly, or, be, or, or below ground, which you hear a lot. About inner earth, which you can get into that's a different topic, you can get deep into that. So, the fact, the fact that there were extra uh, or inner earth terrestrial rep- reptoids, they call them. Uh, I'm just trying to think of the American guy, he's called John Rhodes. I spoke to John Rhodes about those. Uh, he was he'd been John Rhodes is one of the top investigators of the subject, he has been for about 15 20 years. And he was looking into the inner earth reptoids, terrestrial beings that are, that are not from, you know, the Draco star system, as a lot of people want to talk about, or, you know, they're not from the fourth dimension or any other dimension for that matter. They're a very terrestrial race that may or may not have advanced technology. Uh, the rep- See, this reptilian serpent fast subject is, it's like all these subjects. There are, there are, there are, it's like a web. It, it, it comes off, and there are strands that lead here and lead there and there and there and there, and you can quickly get somewhere really, you know, without even planning it. You can get into a subject that you never thought you would get into. No, that's how I came across Pierre Sabac. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, and, and Pierre Sabac writes about a lot of different things. It just so happens that that's I think is that's the, his work, the holographic culture book that he wrote about the uh, serpent gods. Uh, the seraphim, as, yeah. as you will read in the in the ancient text and in the Bible. Uh, when you when I read his work, it was like a eureka moment, really, because yes, I was aware because of my job, I was aware of the ancient cultures that worship the the serpent and the reptile. But because there are so many connotations to the serpent, serpent, you'll know the airlines, the serpent energy, yeah. you know, 
Oh, while they were worshipping the serpent energy, or, they were, or, it, or it was a yogic practice about the Kundalini energy. Yeah. This, you can get, it, it, it can get very quickly get, you can get into very weird areas, you know, again, like, I was like, and it's a complex subject, it really is a complex subject, because you can debate all those things I just talked about. Well, that means that, no, it doesn't, it means this. And yeah. you, you've got a bunch of different researchers all saying, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Oh, saying different things. But Pierre Sabat was one guy that had, had done 15 years research, looking into all sorts of ancient texts and etymology and breaking down ancient texts and, and saying, no, I know this means this because of this. Uh, these serpents are the djinn because of this, you know, yeah. and, and I believe he's right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the reptilian thing was absolutely fascinating because it, it you know, it, it leads you into... Where were we, where were where are we at now in the current modern era? How are things the way they are? What's happening in the world? Why is it the way, the way it is? Again, if what David Grush is saying is accurate, if these entities or this intelligence, as I I'm going to start calling it, has no end of metaphysical abilities and has, as Pierre Sabax has deconstructed reality, and nothing is off the table, is it? You, uh, when you look at what's happening in the world, I find it hard to believe that this is not being manipulated by some form of outside force. Whenever you read ancient texts, that's always the case. When they were when they were making sacrifices to the gods, we'll get deep into that. They were doing it for a specific reason. They were doing it in specific areas. What were they doing it for? What were they getting back? You could argue that that's still going on. What is the sacrifice nowadays? You know, I'll chat to Steve Merritt today about weapons plants, for example. Well, we're studying this and we're studying, we're studying this in a dark hangar somewhere underground in a deep underground military base. And we can't get our heads around this. What are we going to do? We can't figure this out, this weapon. How is it going to work? And how would it work best? Then suddenly, boom, someone comes up with the idea. Or they get the intelligence from somewhere. Someone channels it. You'll hear this about a lot of the great philosophers. They were channeling information. Really? Yeah. Who were they channeling it off? You know. That's what I always think. Uh, so, but, but what does... Again, they're not an easy dots to connect, but what does giving someone advanced technology in a field like war, how does that benefit a fourth dimensional entity? Well, if that technology goes on to cause war and the end game of war is loss of life, that's a frequency, that's an energy. And so, a sacrifice. And there's your sacrifice. It's just a different. It's just not so blatant these days. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and and sacrifice comes in a lot of different ways. It doesn't have to be the end of a life. It can be a feeling. It could be an emotion. And we again, you get a lot of this in the in the alien abduction phenomena. It, well, I got this feeling, and similar with the cryptid phenomena, the the, the dogman phenomena, the werewolf yeah. phenomena. It's an energy. It's a, it's a trade off. It's it's wanting something. Demon possession is the same thing. It's a trade-off of energy, and this is why you can get... Look, just this subject, the, the reps, this is why it's probably the most fascinating subject that I've always been into. There's something in me that knows... There's some, this is connected somehow. This intelligence, I don't know whether that is the form it takes or whether it's a form of, of some of them or one of them or none of them some sort of connection to it I just feel it I just it's just again I shouldn't, it's an area I shouldn't have been going down it's a road I shouldn't have been going down but there was always no matter even with the negative connotations of doing it it's a it's a I think it's a a road that probably similar to where Pierce of fell he was I can't imagine how that must feel like like oh pulling up a stone wow and then and then it whoa and that's what he does. That's how. And that, when you read in the book, it's like, wow, it's one revelation after another, connecting things that you know, the very basic fringe versions of, and he's he's then breaking down. Well, this is why you feel like that, and this is that, and yeah. uh, 
just talked about these ancient gods and the watches and the breakdown of words and the you know the illuminated ones, the shining ones, yeah. and, you know, all that stuff. It's you hear it about all these beings, the the Nephilim, and uh, that's another area you can get into with cryptozoology, even ufology actually. So again, it just runs. This subject just runs and runs. So that's how easy the, the, the reptilian film was to make at first. Again, very similar to Elusive, the pattern was the same. I got into a subject I didn't really know a lot about. Got fascinated by the physical encounters that people were having, and then. It was okay. Well, why are they having them encounters, and who actually are these beings? What is this intelligence? And, and it's the fascination with more now than why. It's not the encounters. There's still going to be encounters in Don't Mention Reptilians Two, which is another sequel I'm working on. Uh, there's just going to be more of a, a look behind the origin of that stuff because previously, before I met Pierre Sabak, I could have done a version of it and it would have been a bit broken and a bit vague and me just probably putting the wrong pieces in the wrong place but now I've got Pierre Sabak's sort of support and his research to include in the film I'm hoping that I can sort of piece this together and make it and, and simplify what is a, a, quite a con- complex area of research and it's been made that way for good reason yeah, I was going to ask how you'd get around that because it is complicated. Uh, when you listen to him, it, it, you, you take it in, you get it, but you listen to him again, you take a lot more in the second yeah. time, and so on. Uh, you will pierce back, you can, just the index, just the index yeah. in the book is something, is something you can read over and over and over. It's very difficult. Oh, you've got it, yeah. It's It's... That the index is actually really useful. Uh, which I, don't, I think I've ever read an index before in any book, but I have on this one. Mm. Um, yeah, I just found it absolutely fascinating. It's it's it is easy to do. You know, when you read the book, obviously it's that thick. Yeah. But the fundamental part of the story is is relatively easy to break down, and I think that's the job as a film. My job as a filmmaker is to try and make it palatable because you've got to remember what you this is a subject it's the subject of subjects if you like because it delves in a lot of ancient religious books that's the yeah. tricky part of this uh, you see that in crypto don't you you see in encrypted in research it's the nephilim and that's your, your sort of religious element of that well you know the christians and it's definitely the nephilim this. yeah and then, well, no, these are just ETs. What are you talking about? No, well, these are just inner Earth beings. And, and then you go yeah, to uh, and, and, uh, and look, who knows who's right? But mm-hmm. it just the Pierre Sabak's research, and there are other other guys that I think Pierre's referenced in in his book that have pieced this stuff together. You know, if you think about it realistically, when you look at uh, the early Fortean researchers, uh, you look at the guy that did the, the Mothman research was that guy. John Keel. John Keel. He kind of figured it out. Yeah, that's He kind of I figured it out. Yeah, did he yeah. call them ultra-terrestrials, I think he called them in the end. Was it John Keel? Ultra. Yeah, was it John Keel? Oh. Is that someone else? No, I think it was John Keel. I think he called them ultra-terrestrials and kind of, they kind of figured it out, but there's someone else. There's something else. And, uh, it's, it's like the Stephen Barry, sir, Steve, Steve Mayer and, and Barry Fitzgerald talk about the phenomena behind the mask. This, yeah. this, this, this intelligence takes many, many forms. And I think more and more people are coming round to that way of thinking because it's in the one thing that these entertainment programs have brought because they're on TV and because we've been able to sort of take that information in. We've been able to piece these bits of information together even though the you know bits of it you know they're not they're kind of on the fringes of it they're kind of broad in what they're saying but there's enough context there to link it you know you might be a fan of expedition sasquatch or uh, finding bigfoot you know but it soon links into well wait a minute skinwalker ranch or blind frog ranch or you know on occasion you know something like Most Haunted, that they encounter a poltergeist or yeah, yeah. something like that, you know. Uh, they all 
they've all been very useful in getting people just excited about the subjects and, and into the into the genre, which is what we're all this is what we're all doing here. Mm. We're all looking for the answers. The chances of finding any are slim, but I think we're now potentially on the precipice of something pretty major. There's some some really good research coming out at the moment. Uh, what again? How far will be allowed to, or how how much of the curtain will be able to peel back and look at is is anyone's guess. Uh, it may well be that you know all these TV shows. If ever, if ever there was a time to commission more of these shows, it's going to be now because of the recent UAP revelations. You're probably going to see more and more of these networks. I mean, usually it's the History Channel, actually, isn't it? And and yeah. Discovery doing this stuff. And Blaze, Blaze, look, you know, channels like Blaze and A&E, A&E on Blaze, I think. I think you're just going to see more and more of this stuff. And it's, it's no coincidence that when you watch the top podcasters like Joe Rogan, his top show, I think, was Bob Lazar. Yeah. You know, people are fascinated by this subject. They might not openly say it, but, you know, even just as, as last week I was talking to someone that said the same thing. You know, I wouldn't openly say I'm into the subject, but I absolutely love it. No. People are openly just happy to say, yeah, I'm a fan of that TV show. Yeah. You know, and, and whether or not it's made up or dramatised, probably dramatised is the better way of putting it, dramatised. So be it. You know, it's, it's entertainment. And if you like that stuff, cool. If you don't, don't worry about it. There are plenty of good researchers out there that can give you a daily dose of I find nothing in the woods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, me being one. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll still be watching it. You know, the same, there's guys like the hunting for UFOs, you know. Who, who actually happen sometimes to capture them with a, the new night vision cameras. I know you've got a decent Sarnex, I've got Sarnex, and more and more U4 researchers are out there buying Sarnex night vision to, to look at the sky. So now, whether or not we're actually looking, what we're looking at is most likely, this is another thing, we're most likely looking at satellites Satellites and our, and our advanced craft. There, because I often, and this is another talking point, I often hear people say, well, how do you know it's, it's, it's ours? You know, how do you know Tic Tac was ours? And it's like, well, it was described as having pinnock tubes for a start, mm. the communication tubes, the communication devices. You know, I don't think, I don't think an intelligence from another dimension needs that, personally. But there's all these little things, and, and it's not, they're not the first time that these things have been seen. That's not to say that they're all military or... I don't think you can actually class them as military because I don't think in some cases some of these uh, uh, secret aerospace programs are not connected to any military at all. The military are not aware of what it, what it is they're looking at. And I think that's what you heard on TikTok videos. They weren't, the pilots were not aware of what they were looking at. They were, in my opinion, they were part of some sort of drill. It's just that the guys weren't in on the drill. Yeah. They were never going to catch this thing. They were never going to shoot it down. That was never the plan. Uh and that's, that's, I mean, that's a long time ago. Those encounters were a while back anyway. So if you think, I always say, when they talk about, well, how, how do you know we have this kind of craft? There are many, many insiders. Ben Rich being, the, I think he was the owner of Skunk Works, was he, Ben, ben Rich? I can't remember. He's one of the guys that had heavy in the industry before he died, said that we've got the, we've now got technology to take E.T. E- e- home. If you believe, if you can imagine it, we've got it. People like John Lear uh, with his connections talked about that. Yeah. There's been other insiders talked about it, and the fact that if you imagine that they're talking about craft that were captured as early back as Roswell, right? Well, that's 1947. I know it was captured before that. There's one in Italy in the 30s, I think. Well, let's just say I was 80 years ago, almost 70 odd years ago. Just look where we've come in. 10 years technology-wise, imagine what the world's best minds can do with a UFO captured 80 years ago, sir. Imagine what they can do with that, the greatest minds on this planet can do. Your intelligence that some human beings have got. You're telling me they haven't back-engineered that and made crafts of their own? Come on. It's silly to imagine that they haven't, and it's also silly to imagine that they will tell you about it. It's also silly to imagine that, that these groups that have no interest in the human story, as, as far as I can tell, whatsoever. You're dealing with a group of people 
Dole, Richard Dole and calls them the breakaway civilization. Yeah. It's highly likely that these groups are off planet, if that's possible, if you believe that. I don't know whether, I don't know, I don't know what's out there. I do believe, uh, if you're looking at certain research myself, that um, this breakaway civilization, yeah, it does exist, mm. and they are maybe 100 to 150 years more advanced than what we are. And when we get things like computers, like now we've got the quantum computer yeah, yeah. coming out, yeah. maybe they had that 50 years ago, Absolutely. and we get the back end. Yeah, well, they we talk get... about the 50 year, not the 30 yeah. to 50 years. And, and 30 to 50 years is, the gap is enormous, and they're incremental. these are incremental jumps as well. So, you know, if we're to believe David Grush, then anything's possible. Not to say that we should believe David Grush, but before David Grush came along, there were plenty of people talking about this, plenty of people talking about this before him. So to imagine that we don't have that kind of technology, I feel is a little bit naive. Again, it's all I can understand the need for it being evidence based, but I just imagine that when you think about the first flight of an, of an aeroplane, for example, or the first engine, that kind of thing, just human beings are actually incredible. Yeah. We, we, the innovations we can make on our own without channeling information from Zorg, from the planet Cryptoid, I, <laughs> you know, that doesn't necessarily have to happen. I believe it probably has happened, actually, but, you know, the, the, we're, we're, we're innovative enough to have developed technology way beyond what we see uh, we just I think people need to get their head around that let's pretend this breakaway civilization is real which I think it, it, it makes just again it's another one of those logical steps that I think is realistic if we talk about the possibility of the end or some sort of cataclysmic uh, situation here on earth which has happened in the past it's been proven it's happened in the past if you were advanced and quietly advanced and you could get off planet or out of the dimension or out of this reality, then, of course, you're going to make a contingency plan to do that. It just makes sense that you want to do it. You're not going to announce it publicly. If you're, you know, in that 0.5% or even 0.1% of people in the know, why would you want to share that information with people that can come and take it off you? That's eight billion of us. What you, you what you mean? You're, you're not taking us? <laughs> no, just little simple things like that. That again, it's like the domino. You can't announce that tech. You can't announce craft the triangular craft like TR3B. You can't openly talk about it, even though it was out there 30 years ago or whatever it was. You can't talk about anti gravity craft. And it's not to say again that these triangles that have been seen, these pyramid type craft that are being seen that's not to say that these are ours that's not what i'm saying when we look through these night visions uh, uh monoculars consumer grade under usually under a thousand pound when we're looking up at a satellite i don't know exactly how high up they, they are we're just seeing that the light mm. reflecting off it that's kind of what a little light there is in that ultraviolet spectrum bouncing off these objects sometimes the objects are lit up we, don't, we can't identify that. We don't know what, what that is. More often than not, it's travelling at super speeds. And there's some research going on at the moment that says that if you can get your hands on a night vision camera that can shoot 120 frames in that light spectrum, then you're going to see a hell of a lot more going on. And I think the right, I would suggest that the reason we don't see these craft is because they're travelling at super speeds that are way beyond the speed of the RI can, can catch. Even 120 frames a second, you'd still struggle to catch them. Again, doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you got Concord. How long ago was Concord travelling? How fast was it going? 600 miles an hour? Concord? It was one thing, yeah. How long ago is that? And that's a public aircraft. Yeah. And imagine what, I mean, seriously, like these drones that they, they must have, the technology they must have, like you said, with the age of this. Look at Google's quantum computer, for Christ's sake. Yeah. You don't have you don't necessarily have to have people flying these craft. 
This is done by super intelligent AI. It's flown by AI. It's not going to crash. You know, on occasion, I'm sure there's some sort of atmospheric malfunction or something. Perhaps that's why the craft came down in the first place. Who knows? Uh, but for the most part, you know, when, when you hear people saying, well, they can't, they're breaking the laws of physics. You know, they can't, how are they going to get from there to there? And it's like, guys, really. Again, it's about, it's, it's, it's just about being realistic with the facts and it's like when you know sometimes when you hear brian cox speak he can tie you up in knots and the grass tyson's and all that. he can tie you up in, with knots with the with the physics because we're just not trained we just don't understand it imagine them times five the, the brain capacity of these people these are the guys that work people like tesla would have been with brain with a brain like tesla iq is off the scale working in secret projects that you will never know the names of these people. You never know the names of these groups developing these craft. You never. Sometimes these groups have no name. Mm. You can't investigate something with no name. <laughs> That's the sort of secrecy we're talking about here. Uh, again, a lot of what I'm saying is, is speculation. Most of it's speculation. A lot of it's just waffle and just piecing things together just off the top of my head. So here, but it, when you listen to insiders with historic backgrounds, family lineages through uh, high-ranking military and some of them in s- secret projects with clearances that they shouldn't have. They're all saying this stuff. You know, sometimes on the deathbed they'll, they'll give this sort of stuff out. But, you know, the, the more than likely, a lot of it has been probably hidden for our benefit, I would imagine. You know, that I will say that. You know, I, w- I wouldn't say that it, it's all nefarious. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff going on that we definitely don't want to know about. Uh, just a few witnesses that I've spoken to with connections like that. There's terrifying things going on. And I think that's one of the elements of, you, of disclosure, why the dominoes can't go over. Because if they do, well, they won't. <laughs> they just won't. So, yeah, uh, I mean, going forward, what I'd like, well, I'm, I mean, I've, I've got Elusive 2 coming out and don't mention. We've got the Winter Hill film coming out. We should probably talk about that. That should be out. We should be able to get that finished. I know we want to continue some investigation, although, don't we, really, yeah. to see if we can get... I'd, I'd love to be able to get some on camera uh, because it does appear up there. We know it does. Well, how many reports have I got? You've you got know, loads of reports. It happens. It happens, and it's about frequenting these areas enough uh, and just being in the right place. This is no, there is an element of. I know I said these things are meant to be sometimes, but sometimes it feels like you need a little bit of luck, and uh, may, maybe just by asking for it, we will, we will manifest it. Does that mean it's less real? I don't know. Well, maybe it's got us on camera. Well, catching it on camera, that's that's the tricky part. But, yeah, going forward, let's get that film finished. Let's get that out. So, yeah, it was only when friends emailed me about Elusive and, you know, I should be chuffed that I've got a broadcast credit. And I, I, I suppose I should. I mean, just shot on a pretty, you know, it's not a film camera or anything like that. I just got out there. I never intended for it to go anywhere. And the fact that, you know, people execs that watch this stuff and are into this stuff all the time and turn a lot of stuff down thought that my stuff was good enough to just fit to feature on the on the history channel it's like it's great you know i I wish it were different i wish it were better and you know next time it will be but you know i think any of us that happen to get our stuff on on tv i think we should be chuffed about it you know I'm, i'm 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 pretty proud of elusive really and not just of the film, and you know, because there's loads, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I'd, I'd do differently. Uh, I'd shoot the whole thing differently, actually. But fundamentally, the witnesses in there are great. The the content's good, and and never it it fe- it's authentic. Is probably what I'm getting at. It's I went into it took completely open and innocent, and I feel I came out of it that way as well. A lot, sometimes it's really easy to go down a road that you, you know, if you, especially if you're selling a film or you, someone wants a film, if you're being commissioned to make a film, well, Chris, you know, this isn't exciting enough. Or Chris, well, can you not make some harm here? Or, or whatever, you know. Uh, I'll never do that. 
it doesn't I'll never do that uh, for TV I can understand why people do that this is a different there's there's documentaries that you know you might want to stick them through out through Amazon and if you're fortunate enough you you know people will see something you know I think it was the human element of that of the elusive that, that the execs liked I think they I think they saw those witnesses and thought we like that human element of the story. We we believe it. We we feel it. There's something about it. There's enough mystery there without, you know, some something. You know, I know we had the footage of, of the tree shaker in there. Yeah. But you know, it would it in, in this genre. It's so it would have been so easy to blob. I had a lot of blob squatch photos sent to me that I could have included in the film. I really could, but I chose not to do that. Uh, that's a, another different subject altogether. Isn't it? Well, yeah, blob squatch is a different story now, and uh, I, I just think with this ad, with the advance of technology now and phot- photographic techniques and AI and everything now, it's just going to get very difficult to sell any story, uh, any photograph as authentic. I think the only way you can still authenticize something if you know what you're looking at. Mm. You know, if you're especially if it's a photograph, if you, you know, there's still metadata that, you know, I think you probably can fake some metadata, but for the most part, an expert will be able to tell the difference. Now, for what that's worth, mate, I don't, again, it was probably, we could talk a little bit about evidence right as we finish now. What, what classifies evidence these days? I think that's always going to be the thing that I used to worry a lot about, you know, it was always something that was in the back of my mind, especially when you're making a film, how do I prove this? I, and probably Paul's, you're the same with what you do with your channel, and Paul Sinclair's the same with his films, and Les Drake, how do I prove what I'm saying? They're not going to believe me. Well, I no longer think about it like that, because I believe me, you know, I believe the witnesses, and that's what's important. Our job really is documenters of, of this, of people's truths, is to put it across, in, and I know you do on your channel, as authentically as you can. Until that time that we perhaps have some budget and we can, and, and you know, some, maybe sometimes uh, an executive or a TV network might say, well, look, you know, we want it authentic so we love that part of what you're doing and they might i might i would make a deal to potentially dramatize something like reenact something in a way in a proper way do you know what i mean i think yeah. that's that's the hardest part about what we do we can never really tell those stories you know i think i budgeted a, a bigfoot suit for the remake for the reenactments in elusive and a budget bigfoot costume was eight thousand pound yeah do that? I can't. No. You know, you can't. How can we get that kind of money to just for one suit? Just for one suit. And that's a very basic suit. You know, if you wanted something movie quality, you'd probably triple that. So, and that's why you need sometimes a commissioner, like a network, to say, okay, well, we love that, but we want the reenactments and we want it dramatizing. And it might just tweak the drama a little bit and, you know, make it a bit more frightening than it was or whatever. But as long as it's authentic to the to the encounter, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Because it's about getting the information out to, to a more people, really. Uh, and for the most part, I have to say that even when stuff I watch stuff, other than there's a couple of shows out there that <laughs> twist truth a little too much. Uh, most of the cryptid stuff that I see, you know, they're being pretty authentic with what they're doing. I think so. You know, every credit to them. And uh, where it's on the entertainment, good for them. 